Let's talk about antiderivatives. So a function capital F is an antiderivative of the function lowercase f if we can say the following. When you take the derivative of capital F of x, you're going to get the lowercase f of x for all x in the domain of little f of x. So <clears throat> I want you to look at this and try to understand uh, what we're talking about here. So capital F is the antiderivative of lowercase f. So when you take the derivative of capital F, you get lowercase f. So it's almost like you're doing the opposite of taking a derivative. And that's why we call it an antiderivative. Okay. So um, let me give you an easy, quick example. So for example, suppose that your lowercase f of x was equal to 2x. Okay. What this would mean is that this would mean that capital F of x would give you x squared. And how can we check that that's true? We can check that's true because um, when I take the derivative of capital F of x, you can see that I'm going to get just 2x, right? So um, the thing is, capital F is really not a unique thing. So if I said, or I could have capital F of x be equal to x squared plus 1. And when we take the derivative of this capital F, we see f prime of x is going to be equal to 2x plus 0, which is just 2x, right? So really, um, in general, we're going to write it like this. We're going to say our capital F of x would just be x squared plus c, where this c is allowed to be any constant, OK? So uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the antiderivative process, which is the exact opposite of taking a derivative, doesn't just give a single function. It really gives a family of functions. So uh, I guess the point is you need to remember to add the plus c in. All right. So uh, what is the general form of an antiderivative? Well, let f be, let capital F be any antiderivative of f, lowercase f, over an interval i. Then for each constant c, capital F of x plus c is an antiderivative of um, lowercase f on your interval i. OK, the second thing I would say is that if g of x, capital G of x, is an antiderivative of lowercase f of x, then capital G of x is really just going to be capital F of x um, plus some other constant c. OK, so what's the takeaway of this statement? Any two antiderivatives of lowercase f of x differ by some constant. So I hope this isn't too confusing. Um, 
you know, basically what we're trying to say is once you have one antiderivative, you can add any other constant and it's still an antiderivative. And when you have two different antiderivatives, capital G of X and capital F of X, these are really just going to only differ by a constant. So why don't we look at a couple of examples or three, four examples, I should say. And I want to find the antiderivatives of this for you. So the first one I want to look at is lowercase f equal to 4 times x cubed. The antiderivative of this is going to be x to the fourth plus c. And I can check by taking the derivative. The derivative of capital F of x is equal to 4x cubed plus 0, which is just the same thing as saying 4x cubed. Okay, let's look at example B. For example B, I'm going to rewrite this. So I'm going to rewrite this as x to the negative 2, like that. And what you're going to see is that um, my capital F of x is going to be equal to x to the negative 1 divided by negative 1 plus c. So again, I can check that just by taking the derivative. If I take the derivative of capital F, that's going to be the following. We are going to um, bring down the exponent. So you're going to have a negative 2 in front. I'm sorry, a negative 1 in front. But negative 1 divided by negative 1 is just 1. And you're going to subtract 1 from the exponent. You're going to get x to the negative 2. And the derivative of um, any constant c is 0. So the derivative of capital F is just x to the negative 2. Let's do another example. Let me rewrite square root of x in exponential form. So it'll be x to the 1 half. And my capital G of x in this particular case is going to be um, x to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves plus c. Uh, I could have actually written this, instead of dividing by 3 halves, I could multiply by 2 thirds. I leave it like this to illustrate a point. Uh, when I take the derivative of capital G, I hope you can see that this 3 halves comes down, which is going to cancel with the 3 halves on bottom. And then when I subtract 1 from this exponent, I'm just going to get uh, 1 half. So when we take the derivative, we're going to get x to the 1 half. And the derivative of c is 0, right? Last example, if I have a capital H of x is the antiderivative of cosine of x, I know that when the take the derivative of sine of x, I'm going to get cosine of x. I want to make sure I add on the plus c. And just as a quick check, if I do uh, h prime of x, that's going to be cosine of x plus 0, which we don't bother writing the plus 0. All right. So um, these are four examples of antiderivatives. And what I want to do next is I want to introduce a little bit of notation. So a lot of times when we say the word antiderivative, uh, there's a synonym for that, which is an indefinite integral. So this is uh, antiderivative is the same thing as an indefinite integral. So instead of writing the antiderivative of lowercase f, I'm going to write this elongated s f of x dx like this. And this means capital F of x plus c. So when we write this thing on the left-hand side over here, this means find the antiderivative. OK, so you're probably wondering how I did those examples. Uh, example one problems. And what I really did was I really used something called the power rule for integrals. So what the power rule for integrals is, it's basically this. If I want to look for the antiderivative of x to the n, that is done as follows. 
we simply add one to the exponent and then we divide by that exponent we just wrote and we tack on a plus c okay so uh there's a couple of i guess key takeaways from this uh one takeaway i would probably mention is that if i find the antiderivative of a constant um, that is just going to be the constant times x plus some other constant so maybe i should call that constant d so you don't get confused um, but you could really find the antiderivative of any power function so if you have like x to the 830 dx that's just going to be x to the 831 divided by 831 plus c. So that's just another example there. Okay. Um, I want to end this video by talking about a couple properties of um, indefinite integrals. So one property we have is that if I have the antiderivative of a sum of two functions, f of x plus g of x dx, I can actually split that into the antiderivative of f of x dx plus the antiderivative of g of x dx. This is also true if I change that plus to a minus, I can split it that way too. All right, the final rule I want to tell you about is we want to find the antiderivative of a constant times a function. And the constant multiple rule says you could factor the constant out of the integral or out of the antiderivative. So then it would actually look like that. Okay. All right, everyone. We'll work on more examples in class together. Take care.